Okay, so we're moving on in Confucius's Analects, Book One, and uh, we're we're on to the second section of Book One, and here we have a description of something that was said by one of Confucius's disciples, Master Yu, and this is a common feature in the Analects. It's not just Confucius's own sayings, but also his conversations with disciples and some of the things that his, his students, that is, and some of the things that his students themselves said. And part of why that's interesting, we won't go into the details of this, but uh, it's thought that when some idea is put into the words, into the mouths of um, Confucius's students in the Analects, that is when the Analects says that a student of Confucius said some particular thing, then the suggestion is that this is one way that the master's teaching can be taken, but it's not the only way. So part of why these ideas are expressed by the students rather than Confucius himself in the Analects is because it's unclear whether or not Confucius himself would agree with these ideas. So that's something to bear in mind. But for the most part, the students' ideas are supposed to be interpretations of what Confucius says. Now, there are cases where a student will say something and then Confucius will correct them, so to speak, or will disagree with them. And what, what that tells us is, uh, again, it gives us more clarity about what Confucius did and did not believe, and also tells us about something about how Confucius reacted in his thinking to certain ways um, of thinking that other people could have. Um, so it tells us something about the kind of um, his kind of response to certain ideas. So the passage reads, Master Yu said, it is rare to find a person who is filial to his parents and respectful of his elders, yet who likes to oppose his ruling superior. And never has there been one who does not like opposing his ruler who has raised a rebellion. So there he's saying, no one who's ever raised a rebellion, a uh, person who's you know actually rebelled against their government, um, has uh, been a person who doesn't like opposing his ruler. So everyone who raises a rebellion is someone who likes opposing the ruler is the claim here. And we might wonder whether that's true. Have all rebellions been led by people who like opposing rulers? Maybe some revolutionaries were reluctant revolutionaries. They felt like they had to do it even though they didn't really like doing it. That's possible, right? But this is part of what Master Yu said. So going on uh, to the second paragraph here, the Junsa works on the root once the root is planted, the Tao is born. Filiality, filiality and respect for elders, are these not the roots of Ren? Okay, there's a lot going on in this passage, uh, but two themes that I would like to start out by emphasizing are filial piety and guidance for rulers. So one, the, the first um, point is that uh, Confucius is referring to filial piety as a good thing here, um, and he does that repeatedly. He encourages people to practice this thing he calls, that's translated in our text as filial piety, which is basically doing, um, being loyal and obedient to one's parents. So showing proper respect to one's parents, um, taking care of one's parents. So these things, and, and, and the notion of filial piety has been expanded in subsequent Confucian thought to include other kinds of family relations. Okay, so what what's the right kind of um, the right kind of um, relation to have with one's elders, with one's superiors within a family, like older brothers, older sisters, and so on. And there's also some guidance about how older brothers should treat younger uh, brothers and sisters. Okay, so uh, that. I won't go into all the details of that, but I'll just say it's an interesting thing that, that comes back again and again, the importance of um, people being, the, then the goodness of people um, being such that they respect their elders and they respect their parents in particular and take care of them. And the other point is um, if you, you know, read this passage and you ask like, why are, why, what, what's this stuff about rebellion? What's why the connection between filial piety and rebellion? Well. The explanation for that, I think, pretty clearly is that this is a, this passage at least, and a lot of other passages in the Analects are um, supposed to be a kind of political advice. You know, there it's advice that could work for 
rulers or um, governors who are trying to decide um, what's the best way to govern whatever um, province or whatever territory they are the political leaders of, okay? And so, um, so the political advice here is one wants to, uh, the, the, sorry, the political advice here is filial piety is a good thing to cultivate within a populace. It's a good thing to cultivate for the people that you lead because people who respect their parents and respect their elders are not the kind of people who will start a rebellion against your government. Okay, so that's an interesting, you know, and maybe useful piece of advice. And that also connects with this claim that the Junsa works on the root. So to make sense of this claim about the Junsa working on the root, we have to know what the words Tao and Ren mean. So the Tao, this is a very important concept in um, Chinese thought and Chinese philosophy. It's often translated simply as way, but it, it sometimes it means an individual person's way, an individual person's Tao. Um, sometimes it means the way of um, of nature, that's just kind of the way that things go. And sometimes it means the best way or the way that things should go, okay? And so here it probably mostly means something like the, the best way, okay, or the way that things should go. Um, but there's a sense in which the natural way, the way in the sense of the way of nature is, is also kind of assumed to be the best, okay? So, um, so what we have here in this first sentence is the claim that the junsa works on the root, like the root of a plant, and when the root is planted, then what what results from that planting is the Tao, the good way for things to go. Okay, and that's very much like this point that if people have respect for their elders and their parents, then they make good citizens, that they won't start a rebellion. And another new Chinese word in this passage is ren. And this is sometimes translated as humanity or simply as goodness. Um, and it, it stands for, it's a very important concept in, um, Confu in, the, in Confucius's Analects. It stands for the kind of highest state of, of mood or orientation or way that a person can be in relation to others. So it's something that the Junza exhibits particularly strongly and frequently, this Ren. It, it's something like, again, humanity, benevolence. Um, one wants to have in mind here something like treating others very well, treating others, uh, in the, but treating others according to a kind of a kind of humble understanding of what human beings require and of uh, what's the different, what's most important in human life and what's not as important and taking care of the most important things first. So if someone was expressing concern about the well-being of their child, for instance, a person who exhibited Wren would show sympathy and would see if there's something that they could do that doesn't require maybe, you know, not something that requires enormous sacrifice, but something simple to alleviate that person's suffering and maybe to help them uh, to care, to take care of whatever problem that is with their child. The most important thing probably for the person that they're talking to is that their child is safe and, and well. So showing Ren towards that person in that situation um, means um, kind of entering into sympathy with their concerns because those concerns really are ones that call for attention, you know, uh, from this perspective of humanity, benevolence, and goodness. So the basic claim here at the end of the passage is that the Junsa works on the root, which is something like filial piety. And from that root, both the Tao, a, the, the good way for things to go, and the good way for a person to behave, and also humanity, this high Confucian virtue of Ren, um, will result from that root of filial piety. And in just the next passage, um, Book 1, Section 3, uh, the Master says, those of crafty words and ingratiating expression are rarely Ren. Here we have an example of a kind of humor and paradox that shows up frequently in the Analects and is part of what makes them 
actually fun to read. Um, it see it might seem like someone who was good with words, you know, had crafty words, and who seemed to want to please you. That is, had an ingratiating expression, trying to make you like them. You might think that such a person um, was probably being sympathetic and had your best interests at heart. But here, the master is correcting you from thinking that. He's saying, Ren, humanity, benevolence, goodness, is not just a matter of telling somebody what they want to hear. Because usually when people just tell somebody what they want to hear um, or uh, are, uh, are very clever in the way that they speak, um, this is uh, part of some more nefarious motive. It's, or it's just a matter of self-interest that they want the other person to like them, to give them a promotion, or to give them a big tip, or who knows what. Okay, so true humanity, true Ren, is not just a matter of getting people to like you by the way that you talk to them. It's a matter of actually being generous and actually caring for what is most important, what's most humanly important in a given situation. Here we have another expression from Master Zhang, another uh, student of Confucius. He says, each day I examine myself on three points. In planning for others, have I been loyal? In company with friends, have I been trustworthy? And have I practiced what has been passed on to me? So here we have an indication of the high valuation that is placed on loyalty, on trustworthiness, and on studying and self-cultivation in the Confucian tradition. And likewise, in section 1.5, we have some more advice for rulers uh, that emphasizes, again, the value of trustworthiness and also um, attentiveness to affairs, or something that we might today call diligence in taking care of one's tasks. And here we have an interesting passage that shows the high valuation that Confucius placed on culture, including things like poetry and history and music. So he, there are repeated references to poetry and music in the Analects, and these are the kinds of refinements of culture that he has in mind. Maybe also something that he calls Li, which is the rituals. So uh, the point here is that people should cultivate basic kinds of moral a basic kind of moral orientation and practice and good habits first. And then to whatever extent they have extra energy, um, they should devote themselves to the arts is basically the, the idea. And there are a number of passages in the Analects that make roughly the same kind of claim. Part of why this is interesting is just that Confucius has a place for appreciating the arts like poetry and music in his um, overall view of what a good human life is like. And the word for culture in this sense is when. The word has a number of other meanings, but um, that's the one that's important in this context. All right, this lecture is getting a bit long, so I'm going to pause here and finish up with Confucius in the next video lecture.